Um, I'll tell you a bit about myself first. I started off life in hospital uh, as a doctor. I knew my destiny wasn't there. Um, and I split my time now between high altitude medicine and the slightly flatter regions of California, where I'm involved in some interesting um, technology projects. My first forays into, into IT for, uh, for the health sector actually was this man's fault, Douglas Adams. And I paid my way through medical school doing IT consulting uh, for the likes of, uh, of Douglas. And it was really inspirations like Douglas that um, helped me realize what the power of information and data processing could do um, for us as a medical profession. And we were pretty behind back in those days. Um, he talked in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which he famously wrote, about a stupendously powerful supercomputer called Deep Thought, who was commissioned by an, a pan-dimensional group of, um, of, of, of hyper-intelligent beings to work out what the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is. And anyone know the answer? Yeah, correct. Not, not particularly useful, but very accurate, or, or maybe not. But um, I realized that therein lay a lot of um, power for us to take data and the kind of processes that go on inside clinicians' heads to make better earlier decisions. And we've come a long way. Um, 200 years ago was the time when uh, Mr. Sims invented the gynecological speculum. 100 years later, and uh, Dr. Friedman was still injecting tuberculosis into turtles as a way of producing antibodies to try and cure it. Um, and just 100, 100 years after that today, let's flip it, we've got clinicians like IBM Watson helping people like Dr. Marty Cohn make better earlier decisions. Um, and so, so we really, really have come an incredibly long way in a short period of time. Um, where are we heading with this? Will computational medicine get us anywhere? Will the data we get from tracking our health actually be of any use? Well, so Ray Kurzweil says that it's only about 50 years from now, 40 years from now, that uh, we'll reach the singularity where all of us will be able to upload our brains into supercomputers like Deep Thought and live forever. I'm not sure that's quite true, but, but equally we are seeing an exponential acceleration in, in the power of computing and the ability to make, help us make decisions. Um, where will we be in 100 years' time? Well, this is an interesting question, and to answer that, I think we have to actually go back in time. Even before the Greeks, to my favourite point in history, Cue the music. Who's that? Darth Vader, of course, the evil villain from Star Wars. Now, Darth Vader actually represents an amazing collection of health tracking technologies to keep him alive. He had 100% burns, lots of internal trauma, no arms and no legs, some subtle things, mental health problems, minor stuff, and of course, and yet he could run the entire galaxy without taking a single day off of work. I think that's pretty amazing. Um, and a lot of the technology we're actually seeing today um, evolve and be available to us. Can we really use it is a question. Does everyone remember his line manager? <laughs> Emperor Palpatine. Now, here's a little story. Um, the person who played Emperor Palpatine is a guy called Ian McDermott. And not so long ago, he was playing on stage um, in, a, in, a, in a play called Six Characters in Search of an Author. And he was playing Father, who is the only character in the whole of entertainment that's darker than, than Darth Vader or, or Emperor Palpatine himself. And he actually, on stage, whilst the curtain call was going, he suffered a heart attack. 
and he was rushed off to hospital and his agent called me and said, Jack, do you think you and, his, you, you and your team can, can, can help him? Is there anything that you can do? Actually, there wasn't anything wrong. He was dealt with incredibly brilliantly and there wasn't much we could do, but it got me thinking, could we use some of the technology that we've been using in elite sport and, and high altitude mountaineering and some of the new gadgets and, uh, and self-tracking devices to actually predict whether things like this would happen to Ian? And the answer is yes. By the way, this is just a little thing. This is the most important text message exchange I've ever had in my life. It says here, Dear, Jack, Dear Ian, hope you're okay. My wife got me the Star Wars 6 episode box sets. I'm just watching your, you demonstrate the peak of your dark side prowess in full, each, full HD. Trust you're well. And he said, Jack, hope your Jedi instincts are still intact. That's awesome. <laughs> that's in fact how I became the Imperial physician. But that's another story. I don't actually work on the Death Star, I work here, which is uh, um, our group in London. Uh, it's a team of scientists and specialists, especially in and around uh, elite sport. And what we do um, is we combine the, uh, the kind of technology and techniques we use in elite human performance science to optimise people's outcomes, both in complex chronic disease uh, and in elite sport. Um, and we've been using sort of very expensive uh, biosensor technology for a very long time and the ability to interpret it as a team of doctors in order to help people do really quite impossible things, like Eddie Izzard running 47 marathons in, in 50 days, like helping Dave Walliam swim the length of the Thames recently and the channel there, and also throwing me in things like heavyweight cage fights in the name of science. It is true, I was up against Nick the Headhunter Chapman uh, and thrown in um, to see whether rest, ice, compression and elevation actually do work. <laughs> it was not my idea. But we do use things like cardiopulmonary exercise testing and we get tons and tons of data, sort of the ultimate, the ultimate in, in, in health tracking. And, and we monitor this on a very regular basis in elite athletes to try and in real time tune their outcomes to see whether we can help them get from a silver medal to a gold or help them recover more quickly. Why can't we use this to tackle some of the bigger problems in complex and chronic disease? Uh, we're able to measure things really quite accurately and make scary predictions about whether people would end up after a particular operation in intensive care or in a high dependency unit or go straight to a normal ward. Again, by using the same kind of principles, techniques and technologies we use in elite sport and have been doing for a long time. We're woefully bad at it in medicine. Most of the tracking which we do today is not much better than, not much better, sorry, than a growth chart. Pretty poor. So we're now seeing the ability for us to take that data from the latest biosensors and make more use of it. It was in February 2012 where I was very kindly invited to the, the FutureMed program in, in the Bay Area in, in California. And it's there where I really understood where we were going to move with, um, with a new sort of wave of biosensor technology. We were seeing things that used to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars that we were sticking on Formula One drivers and elite athletes, and, and we were seeing them now cost hundreds of dollars, tens of dollars very soon. This is an incredible exponential acceleration in the cost and the power of devices, but, but what was lacking really was the ability to make real, clinical, actionable use of the data. There's a lot of talk that we're hearing at the moment about us being able to make actions on this data. But today, the regulatory approvals do not allow personalised data streams to be turned into actions. You're only allowed to go by, um, by best practice guidelines crossing the threshold type data in order, to make, in order to make actions when you're not sitting there in intensive care being looked at by doctors. It's scary. So can we take those data streams from the apps, from the myriad biosensor providers out there? Can we do something within our machines to help them make the same kind of decisions as we do as a team of experts when you're on intensive care, to keep people out of hospital, making better earlier decisions before things have actually gone wrong? And so, comes to the trillion dollar question. Complex chronic disease is crushing our economies. How can we make these decisions, monitoring people in their homes, listening to them, from the biosigns that their bodies are expressing to the observations from their loved ones and caregivers? Can we ingest that data through the apps and the biosensors out there and turn it into action? Can we address the trillion dollar problem of, I think in the US, even avoidable hospital admissions alone for complex chronic disease costs the US government quarter of a trillion a year. 
In the UK, it's about a quarter of that. Over the next 30 years, about $50 trillion will be wasted on complex chronic disease and the cost of people coming to hospital unnecessarily. This is a serious problem, and we have to do something about it. Uh, in the UK, um, one of the things that Professor Martin Elliott, who's the medical director of uh, Great Ormond Street, talks about is this staggering challenge that's been set for us to reduce the costs of NHS spending by 50 billion by 2020. This is frightening, and it's basically, in his view, a productivity challenge that is undoable. Can we use some of our technology that we've been using on athletes then to keep people out of hospital? Let's see. Ha! Huh. We're waiting for data. No data stream. Oh well, you can see me. Am I moving? Gosh, my heart rate's 159 beats per minute. That's pretty scary. Not quite, not quite sure if that's absolutely accurate. I think it's the internet, you can blame that. Well, what we've got here is quite cool. So I'm wearing one of the latest biosensors. Again, these, these, oh, there I am. Can you see me? 148 beats per minute. Let's see if I lie down, what happens? Ugh. Well, it should change in a minute. Anyhow, no one's ever lied down in this auditorium before, I think. Um, so what, what's actually happening is this, this little device on me here. Still, can everyone see that little, little sticky plaster? It's a, it's a Vital Connect bio patch. These things cost $10. You can throw them away. And they're measuring heart rate, heart rate variability, body temperature, posture, respiration rate, a whole myriad of things, 250 times a second, beaming it across to America as it goes. And then the guys up there in the, in the box are, uh, are showing this to you on the screen. And it's, um, we can flip over back to, back to the presentation now. And hopefully, we can take these kinds of data streams and absorb them and actually start to make clinically intuitive decisions based on them. But not only the biosensor data streams, also the observations quantifying the natural language coming from loved ones, caregivers and clinicians when they're looking at you when you're not in the hospital. This is me ripping a bio patch off Alan Shearer recently for the comic relief. Did anyone see the comic relief thing we did? It was quite good fun. Um, basically, we, uh, we took a whole bunch of uh, data streams off them when they were sitting on every seat in Wembley Stadium to predict who was going to win. And in the end, it was actually Alan Shearer that won. Uh, but these things can be very powerful and very predictive. We've built a platform um, in a company which I started in the States called Jointly, Jointly Health. And basically what we do is we take in any data stream, completely device agnostic, completely app agnostic, and we've built a technology that allows clinicians and chief medical officers in disease management companies um, who are in charge of keeping people out of hospital um, to express in natural language um, rules which otherwise only machines are capable of, um, of, of, of delivering. We can create very, very sophisticated rule sets which then, through time, can tell which are the right kind of devices, which are the right kind of data streams we need to gather from people. And we use a new kind of machine learning we call human augmented machine learning, which tells doctors what the machines are seeing that, that they can't see themselves, and asks them to give sort of reasons for it, and helps machines to tune um, their statistical learning, and uh, be able to predict far, far better um, than normal kind of uh, statistical methods. We're able to predict far in advance of normal methods, personal bio patterns and deviations from those to help case managers make better earlier decisions outside of the hospital. And even in the first set of people that we were on, we've had incredible early detection success. And we're hoping that across all the clients which, have been asked, which are asking to use this system, we'll be able to hopefully reduce the costs in hundreds of millions of lives. Um, it's not just as simple as big computers like Deep Thought. To address global challenges, you need clever people. We've had to amass some of the greatest forward thinkers in, in the world of uh, biosensor signal processing and natural language processing, um, and also people who hands-on look after patients in order to create the rules and create this engine. But hopefully, with the power of exponential advances in technology, we'll be able to make some, some very significant advances.
Don't underestimate the power of computational medicine. Also, don't underestimate the power of yourselves. There's an incredible group who's been put together today. You guys have a lot of networking to do, a great many things that we can do together, and a great many policies that we should aim to change, including the rules around how we're allowed to take action on personalized data streams. Today, the, our system is supposed to be the first system in the world, which is FDA approved and CE marked, that enables clinicians to make personalized decisions on data streams. And that's really woeful that we haven't been able to do that before. And finally, don't underestimate the power of the dark side. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. So based on what you're hearing from all the other speakers and based on the fact that you have quite a good overview of what's happening in medicine, if you were starting another business now, funding no object in healthcare, where do you see the biggest opportunity? I think, um, I think the biggest opportunity uh, commercially um, is also where we're seeing the biggest opportunity in impacting numbers of lives. And I still think that um, irrespective of what we're doing, we have to tackle the complex chronic disease area first. Um, that's where the most pain points are in terms of um, payers needing to do things about reducing admissions, reducing hospital admissions. It's where the bulk of our costs really lie. And I think um, if you wanted to find a minimal viable segment uh, in any of the apps that you're going for, in any of the, um, in any of the devices that you're building for, uh, focus on the things that cost the most and would potentially uh, create the most suffering, and that is complex chronic disease, COPD, CHF, cancer, complex diabetes, and mental health. Thank you, Jack. <laughs>